is seven important steps to stay delivered. Now, some of you might be aware of some of the things that I'm going to talk about in this message, but nevertheless, wherever you're at, I think you'll be able to pick up some good things even when ministering to others. So I'm going to jump into those seven major tips to stay delivered. And when I say this, I pretty much mean seven major step uh, tips to stay away from backsliding back into sin because that really is the main way that we were warned about, pretty much the only way that we were warned about in the Bible of how demons could return is if you return to sin. You know, some people get super uh, worried about maybe they wear the wrong cologne or maybe they shake the wrong person's hand and they feel like they're going to, you know, get a bunch of demons back into their life. But I think the concern that we should more so have is if somebody returns to like lifestyle sin, lifestyle willful sin, like lying or idolizing things or uh, sexual sin, drunkenness, this is what can allow the demons to come back into your life in a major way. Now, one thing that I want to clarify before I give this message is a lot of times when people first receive deliverance, um, they might still feel attacks afterwards or other demons that need to come out. And they think to themselves, hey, the demons must have come back because I'm still feeling this weird feeling in my body. I still need to go through deliverance. I'm still having this temptation, that temptation. And the devil whispers in their ear and says, look, you didn't really get delivered or look, the demons came back. And in my experience after ministering to many people, what I find is that it's not so much that the demons came back, but the fact that there's more demons that need to come out. There's more layers of demonic spirits that they were not aware of and now are aware of. So just be aware of that. If you're going to minister deliverance to people, especially, you know, ask them like, uh, you know, if they're saying demons came back into them, ask them about are, are they in sin or not? Or are they just maybe needing to go through more deliverance? Because that is definitely the case many times. But it is also the case where many people return to their sin after receiving deliverance. So I'm going to give these seven uh, tips now, though. And the first one is there is no secret trick to stay away from sin. There is no effort of the flesh that you can do in order to stay away from sin. You need to ultimately just love God and have faith in Jesus Christ. I want to explain what I mean by this before you know, people start making assumptions. And that is, you just simply have to have faith in Jesus Christ to overcome sin and to stay delivered. You know, it really is simple like that. Uh, you don't need to make it all complex. Now, there is a certain time where God will reveal something to somebody, like something they didn't realize. Maybe they're relying upon their own strength, or maybe they have a certain desire that's ungodly in their life. I'm not talking about that. What I am saying is there's no extra effort of the flesh that you necessarily have to put on yourself in order to, you know, overcome sin, in order to stay delivered. Many people will think, oh, I'll just overcome sexual sin when I get married. Or somebody thinks, well, you know, I need to have faith, but I also need to go to my AA program. I need to go to my you know, NA pro, uh, program, or I need to start taking these psych meds, or I need to have an accountability partner. Now, some of these things could be beneficial in, in helping you, but ultimately at the end of the, of the day, to stay delivered, to not return to your sin, to not fall back into your sin, you simply just need to have faith in Jesus Christ, and you don't need to add something else to it, right? And what do I mean by this? I mean, in the midst of the struggle of, of being tempted, you believe that God will supply you with the strength and the sound mind to endure that temptation without going crazy. You know, like if you recently came out of drugs or out of sexual sin, sometimes the devil will put it in people's head like, you can't survive, you're going to explode internally if you don't go ahead and give in to this vice. But having faith in the midst of temptation looks like God, you believing that God will still sustain you, God will keep you and hold you, and you don't have to give in to the flesh in order to make it through the anxiety, the depression, the sadness that comes along with not doing those things. And what I also mean about this is there's no legalistic law. There's no specific rule book, obviously the Bible, but there's no specific tailored rule book that I can personally give you um, in order to stay delivered, right? Ultimately, you know, you need to figure out... <laughs> How much Bible reading you need to do, how much praying you need to do, I can't tell you a specific amount. Even with people who are withdrawing off drugs, right? You know, everybody withdraws off drugs differently. So ultimately, at the end of the day, you have to be led by the Holy Spirit on what to do with these different situations. How much you should pray, how much you should read the Bible, 
in what way you should withdraw of drugs it's different for everybody and they'll they'll go about these things in different ways should i say so the holy spirit doesn't give a one size fits all to every situation in 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 order for you to overcome something or like a 12-step program the word of god says in romans chapter 8 verse 14 for as many are led by the spirit of god they are the sons of god so you know when you're when you're asking yourself how do i stay delivered you shouldn't necessarily be thinking you know you need to do all of these necessary specific things but you should rather be seeking god about being led by the holy spirit learn to follow the leading of the holy spirit and everything else will just kind of fall into place many times and really going back to what i was saying earlier though is when you have faith in jesus christ you just refuse to do sin no matter what the love that you have for god compels you to walk in holiness the love that you have for god you know drives you to not return to your sin let me give you guys an example if you have a family or let's say you have extended family members whatever family you have it's not that complex to not sell them into slave labor let's say somebody gave you an offer of a million dollars to sell your family into slave labor there's no way you would you would do that right like you love your family you could come up with all kinds of different offers. You'll get a million dollars. You'll get this. You'll get that. No matter what the person that presented you with that opportunity, you wouldn't even have to worry about it because you would just refuse to do it no matter what offer came your way. If it was a million dollars, if it was this, whatever you want, right? You, you would just refuse to do it. And it's the same thing with regards to loving God and following, to, uh, following Jesus Christ. At the end of the day, you just need to refuse to do sin, you know, because the devil will try to throw all kinds of different complex temptations your way. But when you're just like, I'm refusing to do sin no matter what, then uh, the, those temptations actually go down a lot, a, a lot, right? And when you're led by the Holy Spirit, you know, God, God will lead you uh, from there many times. So you need to learn to be led by the Spirit of God. Anyways, the next tip that I wanted to give is you need to imagine sinning as too ridiculous and insane to ever do, to make the decision to never do it because it's absolutely insane. Now, I'll give another analogy to you guys. Uh, most of you, I'm assuming maybe all of you, hopefully, are not very tempted to rob a bank right now, right? Even if you were to walk into a bank and there was a really good circumstance, nobody was behind the counter, you know, you just got in there, nobody's even in there. Even if there was really good circumstances for you to rob that bank, the temptation wouldn't even come across your mind. It wouldn't even seem appealing to you, even if there was good uh, circumstances set up for you to rob a bank. Why? Why is that the case? Because you would think it absolutely insane to rob a bank. You would be like, there's no way that I would ever do something like that. Like, that's absolutely ridiculous. The fear of the consequences would just make it so crazy to you that you wouldn't even consider doing it. And you need to have the same approach with regards to sin, that it would be so insane and crazy for you to return to your sin that it's like you don't even really contemplate it. You know, when somebody is still endlessly uh, contemplating doing a certain kind of sin every day, you know that they haven't really been uh persuaded that they're fully done with it when you're persuaded that you're fully done with sin you know actually the temptations start to go down but when you're double-minded and kind of sitting on the fence about it and you're you're still contemplating it as maybe i could do this one more time and so forth the temptations will come the more because the devil knows that he could convince you to still possibly do it now like for an example in my life returning to watching pornography is not even something that crosses my mind as a physical possibility not even something that i could uh you know imagine myself uh contemplating returning to that sin because it's so insane it's so crazy in my mind to even consider that that i don't consider it you know and uh the temptations to do so actually go down dramatically uh, in that situation you discourage the devil because you show the devil that you're not even by like you're not even contemplating doing it right let's say somebody's trying to uh you know at your house they're trying to you know um sell you something they're trying to upcharge you something like sell you cable tv when you're getting wi-fi for an example right if you're just like nope 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 i don't want to do it at every offer they say they're going to be like, all right, I get it. This guy doesn't want cable. But if you're sitting there talking and asking different questions about the cable and how much does it cost? Do I get this? Do I get that? They're going to keep trying to lead you to buy that cable along with the Wi-Fi, right? So you need to have the first mentality that I was talking about where it's like, nope, 
No, you're not even contemplating returning to that sin, right? Genesis chapter 39 verse 9 says, There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So Joseph was telling uh, Potiphar's wife that, he couldn't like it reminds me of what i'm talking about he couldn't imagine how could i do this great wickedness you could tell that joseph was like not even contemplating it because it would be so wicked it would be so insane and obscene to do that it doesn't even cross his mind as a possibility that he could do now when you choose to give up sin the devil will still try to make you contemplate it but by god's grace if you make that decision that you're done with it you know, you can walk in that, that decision a lot better. You can stay away from the sin a lot better. Like, uh, you know, going back to the robbing a bank analogy, the fear of the consequences of robbing that bank, let's say even a lost person, right? Even uh, somebody who's not a Christian, the fear of the consequences of robbing that bank would literally physically restrain them from doing so. Their heart would start racing. They would get all sweaty. They would literally lock in place and they wouldn't be able to rob the bank because the fear of the consequences would be so intense. You need to take the same kind of approach and mentality with regards to sin. Like me returning to lifestyle sin by God's grace, if I was to start contemplating, I know like it, I would literally be physically so nervous and like so shooken up that I wouldn't be able to go through with it. You know what I mean? By God's grace, of course. But still, at the end of the day, you want to take that same kind of mentality. The same that, that same person that has the fear of the consequences of robbing the bank, you need to have fear of the consequences of falling back into sin in a similar way. Amen? So, uh, yeah, we'll jump on to the next one now. The third tip that I have with regards to staying delivered and not returning to your sin is to reverse engineer the attacks of Satan. So when you get thoughts in your head or you're getting attacked a certain way through family, through random people, through whatever, you need to ask yourself why. You need to ask yourself, why is the devil attacking me in this certain specific way, right? You know, sometimes if you get like negative, uh, sinful, degrading thoughts about yourself, let's say for an example, ask yourself why that is happening. And oftentimes, many times, the opposite is true, right? And, and God wants us to turn to him in the midst of these attacks and realize we have a weakness in that area because we're tempted according to our own lust. We're tempted in the areas that we have weaknesses, right? So the devil actually shows his bluff when tempting you, when attacking you. If you keep repetitively getting attacked in a certain area, in a certain area, it's because God wants to refine you in that area and grow you in that area. That's the area that you're actually supposed to grow in many times. So, you know, you could even look at where you're being attacked, especially in an internal way, and uh, think to yourself, Okay, God's trying to show me that I have a weakness in, the, in this area, and he's trying to show me to rely upon his strength and his grace in this area, right? So you can reverse engineer it like that. Okay, the devil's attacking me right here. That must mean that I have a weakness that God is trying to uh, grow me in in this specific area. Like for a couple examples in my life, sometimes I get fear that this ministry will not be uh, continue to be supported. Like when I've been moving recently, the devil puts thoughts in my head of like fear about that. But then I think to myself, okay, God probably wants me to grow in trusting him more about the support of this ministry, about people donating to this ministry. I must need to grow in my trust for God in that area. Or like sometimes when I'm going to go out and street preach, I get some thoughts in my head that are like, oh, nobody's going to listen or, you know, everybody's just going to walk away. Or But then I think to myself, I reverse engineer that and I think, well, actually, there's probably a lot of people here that actually need to hear this message. God is actually probably leading me to preach right here because I'm having so much resistance. Not every time that you have resistance, resistance isn't necessarily a bad indicator. Sometimes, a lot of times actually, it's a, it's a good, uh, you know, it's a good indicator because God allows these attacks to happen to us for our long-term benefit that we grow uh, and conform to the image of Jesus Christ. So if you keep noticing repetitive attacks, especially if they're repetitive attacks, repetitive impatience towards your family, repetitive bitterness towards a specific individual, maybe it's because you actually need to have compassion and love towards that individual. And when you're having these attacks, don't look at them as merely a an attack. If you're getting attacked with anxious thoughts, lustful thoughts, don't just think, oh, the devil's attacking me. Look at it from a bird's eye view. Look at it from God's perspective. Should I rather 
Father say, and think to yourself, you know, God must be allowing these attacks to happen for a certain reason to grow me in this area. And then you won't be discouraged all the time when you get attacks. You could think God's actually trying to grow me, right? Now, you can't always use this rule of thumb that like if something's bad is happening to you, something's not coming through, that it's therefore because God wants you to have it. Like for an example, if you're trying to get a $150,000 car and it's just not working, you can't say, well, it must be because God actually wants me to get this $150,000 car. You can't always use that rule of thumb, but nevertheless, you can still uh, examine it. And uh, there's a couple different reasons as to, you know, sometimes you're having blockage because it's not God's will. It's usually one of the two, right? It's usually you're get if you're having blockage, resistance from the enemy, things are not working out. It's either because you're not in God's will or because you are in God's will and the devil's trying to stop you from walking in God's will. But how do you tell the difference? You tell the difference because there is still fruit that is born when uh, you're doing the right one, right? Like for an example, I've had some resistance since I've been, uh, you know, here in this house, I moved recently, I've been having some resistance from the enemy, but I still notice good fruit coming forth in the midst of that resistance. I still see things working out, God moving, people getting delivered, people coming closer to God, people coming to repentance. So, you know, when you are in God's will and there's resistance, you will also see a good outcome, a good, uh, good fruit of the situation, right? If you're not in God's will, you'll just have the blockage and no good fruit along with it. Okay. And when I say good fruit, I just mean a good outcome of the situation. Okay. The fourth tip that I wanted to give, which kind of ties into the last one with regards to staying delivered is you need to find a redeemable aspect out of anything that happens to you. Romans chapter eight, verse 28 through 29 says, and we know that all things, and I just want to emphasize that point, even though it's obvious, all things, every single thing uh, works together for the good of them that love God, for those who love God and that are called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknew, it's important to read this next verse as well too, I realized, for whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might bring uh, be the, the firstborn among many brethren. So this verse is telling us that God works all things to the good. And how does he work things to the good in this specific context? In the sense of conforming you to the image of Jesus Christ. God works all things to the good of those who love him so that they will be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, right? So that just really shows how much God cares about our sanctification. God is looking to conform you to the image of his son. And going back to the thing that I was talking about earlier with regards to having the attacks, you need to think, how can I grow? How can I become more like Jesus in the midst of these attacks? And, you know, in the ministry of deliverance, this is what is happening when you receive deliverance. God is conforming you to the image of his son. You are becoming more like Jesus. When you receive deliverance, when you receive sanctification, you become more like Christ. When you live in sin and you live uh, for the devil, you become more like the devil. Either way, you're going to go, right? So that's really important to take into consideration. And when you have this in mind that literally anything that happens from when you wake up to at the end of the day, God can use it for your good. You're never really fully cast down like the word of God says in the book of Proverbs that the righteous may stumble, but they are not utterly cast down. You will just come back stronger. Now, now, even when you're aware of this principle, you might have some seasons where your faith is kind of like discouraged. But if you are aware of this, it'll always just come back stronger. You'll be cut down, but then you'll just come back stronger, you know, and you're just a, a relentless force in that situation when you take this into consideration. Even some of the worst things that could happen to you or for, uh, for you, God will work it out for the good. That's just how amazing God is that he can literally work all details of our, uh, our life out for the good. And I've seen that in my life, praise God. So, you know, another thing that's important to take into consideration though, with this in mind is you don't have to know the redeemable aspect of what's happening. You might have repetitive frustration with somebody at work. You might have continual discouragement with something in your family. And, and you think to yourself, well, that's not true. I don't know why this is happening. You don't have to know the why. You don't have to know how it's going to work out for your good. You just have to submit God, uh, to God and realize that he promised that it will work out for your good. Even if, you know, many times in the midst of bad things happening, you don't, you're not really aware of this, but you just need to mentally make yourself know that this will work out for the good and you will see it to come to pass 
if you truly love God, right? And that, you know, this reminds me of the life of Jonah, right? Like uh, God even used him, uh, you know, veering off from the course for his good. So, you know, I believe even when uh, Christians make mistakes or God forbid, if a Christian was to fall into sin, God can even turn around that for the good as you know some religious spirits not might not like to hear that but this actually helps people that have backslidden right because when you when, when an individual has backslidden that the devil starts to tell them there's no hope for you you're done it's over with but if you keep in mind god works all things out for the good of those if you really love god god will work that mistake god will work that season of weakness out for your good, you know, but if you really love God, you're eventually going to come back out of that sin and, and get right back on the right track with Jesus, right? So, uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much what I wanted to say for that one. Sometimes he could work things out for the good that, you know, he'll take things out of our life as well, too, that we might not want. Sometimes God, you know, the Lord takes away from our life, but even that can be used for a good. Like, Maybe the Lord leads you to break up a relationship or end a friendship with somebody. You know, you have to think of even the stuff he takes, not only the stuff he gives you, but also the stuff he takes away can be used for your good. You know, I believe, you know, God is even, God, God loves so people so much that he would allow their life to completely fall apart. Like uh, there was somebody, I'm not going to mention their specific name, but their ministry and their, their, their engagement and all kinds of stuff was falling apart in their life because they weren't repenting of this sin and things just started to fall apart. And this individual ended up repenting and, you know, the Lord, I believe restored you know, at least some of that so far in his life, but God wants us to, re he, he loves us so much. He wants us to repent and be conformed to the image of uh, his son, Jesus, that he will allow even something like that ha to happen if it comes down to it. You know, you could give heed to conviction the easy way or the hard way, you know, the stubborn way or the easy way. You know, giving heed to conviction the easy way is just turning from the sin when God convicts you. But some people are stubborn and God has to start taking stuff out of their life or chastising them in a major way for them to repent. But uh, it's his goodness either way. Anyways, uh, the next one that I wanted to talk about, uh, tip number five to stay delivered, is to cut off any life circumstance that causes you to sin. Matthew chapter 5, verse 28 says, And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is more profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. There's certain things in your life you can't fix. There's certain things in your life that you can't try to get in there and make all the details work together. You just got to cut it off. You just got to completely eradicate it from your life. You know, uh, I'll give an example. When I got hurt when I was 19 years old, I had three, uh, I had third degree frostbite on my feet. I went to the hospital and they were saying they're going to have to cut my feet off. Now, in that situation, why would they have to cut my feet off? It would actually be beneficial to my whole body that my other, my leg and my thigh and the rest of my body doesn't end up getting infected. It would be beneficial to the rest of the body if they were to cut the feet off. Now, by God's grace, the Lord healed my feet and I still have my feet today. Day. Praise God for that. But I just wanted to use it for an example. And I'll give a more practical example. There are many women that start to follow Jesus and they're still in a relationship with a boyfriend or an ex-partner that uh, wants to fornicate with them. And they go in there and try and fix it and tell their uh, ex-boyfriend or whatever about the Lord and that ex-boyfriend's not hearing it. And they try to fix it and fix it. But they keep putting themselves in the situation to fornicate with that ex-boyfriend or whatever it might be. When it comes to that situation, many times you can't go in there and, and fix that. You know, you could just got to cut the hand off. You've got to cut the foot off altogether. So sometimes that's what you got to do. You can't go into the member and do surgery. It's better to just, uh, you know, cut it off. And like I was saying, it, it, this is a loving thing to do because then it actually saves the rest of the body. If you have an infected hand, it would be better to cut that hand off than for your entire body to get infected and for you to possibly die. And that goes along with the scripture. That goes along with what Jesus was teaching. It's better to cut the hand off than for your entire body to be cast into hell. So sin is like a cancer, right? Some people think they could sweep sin under the rug. They could keep that one sin and it won't affect the rest of their life. 
but it will affect the rest of your life. Like many people just want to hide their sexual sin under the rug, but it will affect the rest of your life. You know, you have to deal with that. You have to uh, ultimately cut that off. So sin is like a cancer or, or an infection that will affect the rest of the body. And that's why you just have to cut some circumstance. You just have to cut some relationships off. You just have to cut some devices off. And you you can't go in there and fix it. You just got to get rid of it and cast it off from you before it affects the, the rest of you. And the devil doesn't really care why you sin. The devil doesn't care why you sin, if you want to sin, if you don't want to sin. He is a legalist, and the demons are legally allowed to come back into you if you return to sin, even if you didn't. You know, some people message me or when I'm going to pray deliverance for them. They're like, no, I don't want to do this sin. And that's great. That's a good start. But that's not the final step. You know what I mean? You actually have to adjust, You actually have to overcome the sin. You can't just say, I don't want to do this sin. That desire is not enough. The rich young ruler desired to follow Jesus Christ, but he walked away sorrowful and did it. And he had desire to follow Jesus Christ, but he wasn't able to perform that which God was calling him to do, right? So that's really important to take into consideration, even if you don't want to do the sin. You know, and, and I'm saying this in correlation to Matthew chapter 5, right? Because you could keep putting yourself in those circumstances, like maybe that, that woman or those women that I'm talking about, they really don't want to fornicate. In their heart's desire, they don't want to fornicate whatsoever, but they're not having faith in God to cut that situation out of their life, so it keeps causing them to sin, like the verse says, right? Anyways, the sixth tip that I wanted to talk about is to be aware when you're spiritually drained or empty. Many Christians are not aware that they are spiritually weak, that they are uh, being drained of spiritual energy until they're to the point where they're almost backsliding, until they're at the edge of their seat about to return to their vomit, about to return to the mud. You know, this is really important to take into consideration that you need to be aware of when you're getting spiritually depleted well before you're at the place where you're about to backslide. And I think of a phone with regards to this. Like when your phone starts to get low on battery, it'll give you a warning, warning, 20%, 15%, whatever. And the screen will start to go dim and certain apps will not start to work uh, as good as they previously did. And you need to be aware of those warning signs similarly when you are feeling spiritually drained, right? Like many people, you know, they, especially when they start neglecting consistency in prayer and reading the Word of God and uh, so on and so forth, you know, they start to become ignorant of those warning signs, you know, just quickly, dis they just want to keep staying on the phone and not charge it. But, you know, as a Christian, you want to, uh, you know, charge yourself, spiritually speaking, even while you're still at like, well, at uh, 80, 90 percent uh, and so forth. And one of the best ways to do this is to just um, have consistency in your prayer life, have consistency in uh, disciplining yourself in the things of God. Now, um, I plug in my phone every night. I never really worry about my phone dying because I plug it in every single night, you know? And uh, you could apply a similar thing with regards to consistency in your spiritual walk, uh, being strengthened spiritually, right? You know, and the warning signs, you know, you start reacting in the flesh really quickly, or a, a sin that you used to fight in five seconds in your mind, now you're dwelling on it for five minutes, for 10 minutes. Those are the warning signs that you want to look for, spiritually speaking, that you need to go and seek God before you get down to 5% and your uh, phone about dies, you know, metaphorically speaking. Okay, and the seventh tip that I wanted to give is to allow your passion for Jesus to outgrow the desire of sin. Ultimately, at the end of the day, you can try to abstain, you can try to stop doing things outwardly, but, uh, you know, you need to have a heart transformation. You need to allow the love of God and your love for Jesus Christ to completely, you know, just make sin look ridiculous. That's the best thing at the end of the day to keep your heart pure, to keep your heart not wanting after sin, is to spend that time with the Father, spend that time with and growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and getting to know Him better. That, you know, because then your passion for God will just be like way higher and uh, you will look at sin as completely ridiculous. Uh, Galatians chapter 6 verse 14 says, But God forbid that I should boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Paul said that he was crucified to the world. That means 
you know, the desire in him didn't even arise, I believe, in cer at least in certain circumstances. When you're dead to something, let, let's say somebody's physically de dead. They don't have a desire to eat at all. They don't have a desire to drink. They don't have a desire to sleep at all. They're just dead. They don't have those desires, you know, and you want to die to the world in a similar fashion. When if you used to be a weed smoker, you can walk past the weed store and the desire doesn't even rise up in you. Now, when you first get born again, many times it won't be, you know, it'll be a process to get to that place but uh still nevertheless or you know like for an, another example let's say you used to love to watch a bunch of worldly movies now you see a worldly movie uh advertisement pop up on your uh internet pop up you know when you're on the computer and the desire is just dead within you you want to crucify those desires right and uh you know that's also ultimately the best way to uh go about it because there's somebody that's teaching on the internet that you should just avoid temptation you know, like w with regards to this uh, individual that I'm speaking about is, uh, you know, he just tries to stay away from any opportunity where he could be tempted with lust. But, you know, the devil will still find a way to tempt you with sin. You can't avoid temptation while you're in this world. You can try to not put yourself in bad circumstances where you're going to be tempted. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying while you're in this world, you will be tempted to do different sins at some point or another. You can live a life where you avoid a certain degree of temptation. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to fight and overcome temptation. You can't run from the battle. You have to fight in the battle. Like so, let's say somebody used to be a drunkard. They used to be an alcoholic, right? And they're going to, you know, they don't really want to get deliverance. They don't really want to overcome that desire of being a drunkard. They're just going to try to avoid every circuit. They're going to try and drive past every billboard about alcohol. They're going to try to never walk past the bar in all of these different things, but those temptations t could still come. What if you have a dream about alcohol? Or what if, you know, you, um, you know, a, fr a friend at work comes up to you and asks you if you want to drink. You, you, you can't avoid those. You just got to die to those temptations. you got to die to those desires. And that goes back to kind of what I was talking about earlier with regards to choosing to never do the sin again. And let me just say this as well, too, guys. Uh, you know, don't avoid sin just because just merely because it will allow demons back into your life. There are some people that ask me questions and I could tell that their focus is not really even on if I do this, will it displease God? But they're just thinking, if I do this, will I get demons? But you have it backwards in that situation. You should ask yourself, if I do this, will it displease God? Well, then demons are probably going to come in. You know, not the other way around. Some people are just avoiding sin so that they don't end up getting demonic spirits. But uh, you should ultimately, first and foremost, avoid sin because it will break the heart of God. Because it will offend a thrice holy God. Amen. So uh, I think I'll pretty much leave it off with that. You know, so I hope you guys were blessed by this message in the name of Jesus. You know, I guess what we're going to do right now is jump straight into deliverance. Amen. So I hope uh, that you guys were blessed. You know, even if some of you are aware of how to stay away from backsliding, that you got some good things out of this. And hopefully you can minister to others as well, too. Because, guys, I'm shocked being in the ministry of deliverance. How I shouldn't say I'm shocked, but I am surprised at how many people actually actually go back to sin actually end up backsliding after they've become truly born again i'm not talking about somebody that was just like a pew warmer and they just grew up in the church and they weren't really truly converted i'm talking about people that even truly got converted so many of them return to backsliding so you know you guys would actually be i don't you know for those of you who don't do deliverance at least you would actually be surprised at how many christians backslide back into sin you know, you could look on Facebook, you could look at uh, uh, in church and stuff and, and think it might be a pretty small number, but really a lot of people do at, at one point or another. So I think there needs to be more ministers to ra uh, to be risen up, you know, to minister to people that have backslidden and to, uh, you know, get into the ministry of deliverance because that's really needed when ministering to people that have backslidden, right? Obviously, I would think so.